Good evening. I'm Marion Dry, Chair of Class Act HR 73, and it is my honor to welcome you to this Class Act Forum, Half Earth, Conserving Biodiversity from the Deep Ocean to Mount Everest. I'd now like to introduce our panelists and moderators, and we are very excited this evening that this forum features five HR 73 classmates. First, marine scientist and moderator Jesse Ausubel has initiated and led numerous US and global environmental research programs. From organizing the first United Nations World Climate Conference in 1979 to counting all of the fish in the sea during the decade long census of marine life, he has pioneered use of new technologies to diagnose and anticipate environmental change. Widely recognized and honored for his contributions, he directs the program for human environment at the Rockefeller University in New York City. Botanist and moderator John Kress is distinguished scientist and curator emeritus at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. After having served as interim undersecretary for science at the Smithsonian, he's currently co-chair of the Earth Biogenome Pro Project. Among his 250 scientific and popular papers on nature are his books, Plant Conservation, A Natural History Approach, The Weeping Goldsmith, The Art of Plant Evolution, The Ornaments of Life, Co-Evolution and Conservation in the Tropics, and living in the Anthropocene, Earth in the Age of Humans. Author and conservationist panelist Brock Coburn has worked in Nepal, Nepal, Tibet, and India for over 20 years, overseeing development and environmental conservation efforts for various international and UN agencies and NGOs. He was involved in the creation of two protected areas near Mount Everest and Annapurna and has written or edited nine books. Retired attorney and current educator and activist, panelist Sharon Tischer, has taught at the University of Maine for 27 years, engaging students in the core civilization sequence and environmental law and policy courses in the ecology and environmental sciences program. She has been a speaker and frequent opinion columnist on environmental issues in Maine. Finally, educator and panelist Dean Wong, Professor Emeritus at University of Vermont, has taught courses relating to ecology and education, including conservation, greening systems and sustainability, emphasizing service learning and experiential learning. His research has been on biogeochemistry and nutrient cycling at the ecosystem and landscape levels, and more recently on sustainability and education. It's now my very great pleasure to welcome my classmate, John Kress, to begin this discussion. Marian, thanks very much. And thanks for all of you to join us this evening. And particularly thanks uh, to the panelists and Jesse Ausubel, the other moderator, or the co-moderator. Uh, to many of us, the world seems to be in a rather sorry state of affairs these days, uh, not only socially, economically, and politically, but also environmentally with the rampant loss of biodiversity and escalating global temperatures. But I do want to remind everyone here tonight that things have been worse. About 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous, an asteroid smacked into planet Earth causing massive environmental destruction and species extinction, including the demise of the dinosaurs. It was pretty bad then. But out of that destruction arose a great expansion of new living things. The flowering plants expanded, new insects came into being, birds and mammals, and one species called Homo sapiens also began to take shape. The world of biodiversity got going again after that major impact 65 million years ago. This is exactly what Ed Wilson, as my professor in a hall full of undergraduates in Biology 101, taught me about 50 years ago. He taught me that life is unbelievably complex, that it is easily perturbed, but that it goes on. And I have taken that to heart to this day. Ed Wilson was an inspiring teacher, a diligent scientist, and an unrelenting global environmental advocate. And after devoting his career to understanding and protecting nature, he came up with the idea near the end of his life 
that the only way to keep life going this time around after the mass extinction uh, was by setting 50% of the planet as a protected zone long into the future. How long will this need to be protected at 50%? I think for as long as it will take us, the single species that is causing this upheaval, to learn how to coexist with the other 10 million species on this planet. He called this idea half Earth, and that is what we're going to talk about tonight. In 1990, about 4% of the Earth, of the land and oceans, had been set aside as protected area. That's 1990. Today, about 17% of the Earth is protected, which includes one sixth of the land and about one twelfth of marine areas. Upcoming in December of this year in Montreal, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity uh, will call for protecting 30% of the land and sea areas by 2013, by 2030, excuse me. That's about twice as much as is protected today. That 30% goal has been reflected and advocated by a number of other organizations as well. It's called the 30 by 30, 30% 30 by 2030 effort. Half Earth, goes, Half Earth goes beyond that in looking at 50% target for the planet. But are any of these goals possible? Or should we even be talking about them in this day and age? This evening, we have convened a panel of classmates of class of 73 who have worked in the field of biodiversity and environmental conservation for a good part of their careers. To achieve the goals of Half Earth will require a major boost in land and sea protection and also significant changes in our lifestyles, our utilization of natural resources, our economies, our cultural practice, and our political priorities. This sounds a bit like what the planet faced back at the end of the Cretaceous, just before the dinosaurs went extinct. The difference is that today, this environmental crisis is being caused by just one species, us, and not an asteroid. Unlike that asteroid, we might be able to change course if we choose to do so. So tonight we will focus on the necessity for and the merits of half Earth for protecting biodiversity across the planet. So let's get going. I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse Osabel now who will begin to ask our panelists to address some questions. Jesse. Thanks, John. That was a terrific introduction. And I just quickly want to turn the clock back to April, 1970. April 22nd, to be exact, the first Earth Day. And many of us marched along Massachusetts Avenue past uh, the Waldorf Cafeteria, past uh, the BIC and uh, other uh, stores long gone to a rally on Cambridge Common. And if you had said to me at the time that it would change my life, I think I would have been surprised, but it did. <laughs> and we also spent a lot of time staring at the glass flowers uh, in the MCZ with some of the people on this call. Uh, let me say hello to all classmates and friends. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of people out there to whom I'd like to give big hugs. And I hope we'll be able to do that uh, around the 1st of June at the, at the 50th reunion. Well, anyway, if you go back, as John suggested, uh, if we go back a couple hundred years, uh, there wasn't any much of an idea of protected areas. I'm a New Yorker. We have Central Park. If we could turn the clock back, I think most of us now think that we would have many more parks. But the, the half earth idea is a big idea, that a big stimulating idea that it's, we're saying it's not too late. Uh, uh, maybe we can share the planet a bit differently going forward, uh, just in the way that if we had done it differently over the last few centuries, there would be a lot more uh, of the rest of life uh, here with us now. Well, Earth Day is an accepted idea now, 50 years, everybody all around the world, not just in the US. And Half Earth, we hope, will be that way too. So uh, it seems like a very radical idea now, but we hope to start uh, more conversation among ourselves uh, and uh, uh, stimulate more between now and, and uh, May, June, and then after that, and uh, learn and see whether this big, simple idea uh, may help us to uh, uh, share the planet uh, in a way good for ourselves and good for the rest of life as well. Okay, with that introduction, let me now turn to Brat and uh, pose the challenge. We'd, we'd like you to say a little bit about the biggest environmental challenges bio and biodiversity that you faced in your own lifetime as an educator, explorer, uh, advocate, and uh, how do you feel you're doing? What's uh, 
Um, tell us where does the where do the Himalayas stand? <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Jesse. Um, you know, we graduated at a wildly expansive time in global history, and we're still on the upward curve of what John and others have referred to as the Great Acceleration. The world's population has almost exactly doubled since the day of our graduation in 1973, and it's more than tripled since I was born in 1951. Well, Professor Wilson's course really uh, transformed me, though I ended up majoring in soc rel. Uh, so I didn't really have a plan after college and I was promptly uh, recruited into the Peace Corps and was sent to Nepal. Now, um, and there may be a slide of the Himalayas there. Um, when I experienced the magnitude of the mountains, landscapes, and biodiversity of the Himalayan range and saw the significant threats to the environment, I felt compelled to at least try to be a part of the solution. That's the Tibetan Plateau on the right and the Gangetic Plain of India on the left with the elevation dropping from 29,000 feet to 400 feet above sea level within a 50 mile range. More than a quarter of the world's population lives in river drainages that flow from the Himalaya. Well, uh, uh, thanks for the slide. It, it turned out that the early 1970s were a remarkable time for Nepal. The country had just begun developing its system of national parks. Uh, and now 23% of the country has at least some protected area designation. So I jumped into helping propose the creation of the Annapurna Conservation Area right in central northern Nepal. But this required a new way of thinking, considering that 100,000 people lived within the proposed protected area boundaries. The concept, supported by the royal family, was, was to create village-level natural resource management systems, which would also provide Develop, development assistance, such as schools, tree nurseries, and economic aid, as a trade-off for a consensus among villagers about regulation of local resource use. The concept was uh, supported initially by WWF and spread widely to foreign aid agencies, such as, such as the World Bank and USAID and became what we now know as conservation and uh, development. Well, 30 years later, we can say that this model has worked uh, to conserve and protect landscapes and biodiversity in some areas, but we're continuing to face a relentless drumbeat of economic development driven partly by the imperatives of multilateral and bilateral aid agencies such such that now conservation and even terms like climate change adaptation serve mainly as a sexy tagline or a buzzword or an afterthought or a noble addendum to the international economic development imperative. Now, motor roads are one of the arteries that bring this development, but they destroy and fragment habitat. Over the past decade, especially ad hoc, poorly constructed, unstable motor roads are being dug across the entire Himalayan range. And they're transforming it physically, economically, and culturally at an astonishing rate. The south side of Mount Everest, which was designated as a national park and a World Heritage uh, Site in 1977, is a bit of an outlier because the local Sherpas have resisted roads arguably out of economic self-interest as they benefit from controlling the lucrative trek and mountaineering trade. Uh, one quick thing to add is that the collection of garbage on Mount Everest has been elevated to an environmental triumph, but it's really nothing of the sort. Litter there on Everest is essentially inert and it's almost entirely an aesthetic issue and primarily a Western aesthetic at that. But I'd like to mention the case of Chitwan National Park, which is part of a necklace of 13 protected areas along the lowland and Nepal-India border. It's known as the Torai Arc landscape. Over the past decade, the tiger and rhino populations have doubled there, despite numerous external threats and plenty of human-wildlife conflict 
between people and tigers, rhinos, and other wildlife. Ecotourism deserves much of the credit here, at least, if it weren't for wildlife watchers and monitors and a shared sense uh, um, in the surrounding villages that wildlife and intact habitat are a national and international treasure, then the park would have been long ago overrun by an endless flow of squatters from the hills. Oh, Brad, that's a great introduction. And the, the, as, the, as all of the participants in the, the forum will hear, we're going to be, we're, we're now we're going, for, we're go, we'll go from the top of the earth now to, uh, to Maine nearby and also the global climate. Sharon, tell us a little about your own experience and journey. Well, the biggest challenge in my work has been working with college undergraduates and trying to help them understand why climate change is their future, as well as the future of all of the species they'll be studying in their science classes. Trying to get them to understand this without giving up and without surrendering to cynicism. Of course, the heart of the answer to this question, why, is the disastrous gap between the progress science has made in understanding the problem and the progress of political and economic institutions in building a fix to it. And this problem comes to roost with us, the United States. China surpassed the United States in annual greenhouse emissions 16 years ago, but the US is still the largest historic producer of the greenhouse gases up there. The United States still owns greenhouse, the greenhouse. Um, but too often, despite our ownership of the problem, our country has been an outlier and indeed an obstructor in making progress on the solution. Yes, the Inflation Reduction Act is the biggest climate action the US has taken, but it's sadly the only action on climate that Congress has taken other than funding research from time to time in the 65 years since Roger Revelle's 1957 testimony to Congress and published research warning of the dangerous consequences of global warming. 2024 will be an important bicentennial. It's 200 years since the first published research on global temperature and atmospheric gases. The first formal expression of concern by a world leader about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere came probably in President Johnson's speech on conservation in 1965, more than 140 years after that first published climate science. The first actual regulation in the US aimed at controlling greenhouse gases came in with President Obama's 2010 vehicle fuel efficiency standards 53 years after Ravel's warning. So this problem is not just on the US, but on our particular generation. Part of the great acceleration that Brat mentioned has been in our energy use in the US. From 1950 to 2000, our lifetime, beginning of our lifetime, Industrial nations per capita energy use more than doubled to just under 200 gigajoules per person. Per capita energy use in the US more than tripled for the same period to 340 gigajoules per person, more than 50% than the average of all industrial nations. We, all of us, rode that wave. So I tell my students that the upside to living in the time of the climate crisis is that everyone wants to make a difference and there's no more important time to be a human being and to be a citizen of the United States than now. We can make a difference if, of course, we continue to have a reasonably functional democracy, which some might be concerned about. So I try to, I've tried to give my students some tools for civic engagement. I created um, UMaine's first climate policy course with an emphasis on skills of communication and collaboration. I turned the final unit of the Honors College's 16 credit civilization sequence into a unit on climate change. And I continue to write the UMaine website 
a climate phrenology that I put together starting about 10 years ago. And that's covered in a short film by Rick Brotman on our Class Act website. Finally, I joined um, the Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Corps and was trained to give his lecture and gave it all over the state for about for two years. And I highly recommend that and can share that experience with anyone who wants more information. So what does all of this have to do with biodiversity? Just about everything. And not just because climate change is turbocharging the species extinction, because the same policy failure happens here. It's great news a couple of weeks ago that the Biden administration has appointed its first envoy for biodiversity, Monica Medina, and she will go to that COP meeting on biodiversity in Montreal that John mentioned to argue for a commitment to conserve 30% land and water. Great leadership? Not so much, because 50 other countries have already committed to that goal. The problem is that the US is technically just an observer at that meeting, not a participant, because it has never signed on to the UN Convention on Biodiversity, which came out of the same 1992 conference in Rio as the Framework Convention on Climate Change. 196 nations have ratified the Convention on Biodiversity and US is the sole remaining holdout. Just as we failed to ratify Kyoto for mandatory emissions limits, we failed to ratify the Convention on Biodiversity. Herein lies the problem. The problem is us. Sharon, thanks very much for those thoughts. Your students are fortunate to have you teaching them. I'll tell you that. Okay, Dean, it's your turn. Give us some idea of what the biggest challenge to biodiversity that you've experienced during your career. So the challenge that I've faced in my career as an ecosystem ecologist is thinking about how to frame the questions that we're working with. Um, our conceptual models really influence what we can find out and how we think. Uh, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, I, I worked on uh, developing compartment models that allowed us to really sort of take apart nutrient cycling and uh, how carbon, how nitrogen, how calcium cycle through ecosystems. Uh, and, and we learned that a whole bunch of things and we've set up uh, a way of thinking about um, ecosystems that really has led us to be able to handle the carbon uh, issues uh, that are related to climate change now. But, but an interesting thing along the way of framing those kinds of questions that way is that, um, those compartment models essentially ignored species level biodiversity. So here, here's a, as, a, as a student like the, the rest of you who sat in E.O. Wilson's classroom and other zoologists and botanists at Harvard telling us how important species level biodiversity is. The, the first kind of research that I did really said, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, to think about how nutrients cycle, uh, we lump things together into these broad categories, and we can learn things about it. And, and we certainly did learn things about it. But the question that I faced then is, okay, as, as, a, as a scientist trying to frame these questions by framing out species level biodiversity, you, you know, what does that do to how we think about ecosystems? But the next thing I'd like to, to describe is um, during the International Biological Program in the 70s and the 80s, we coincidentally, discovered computers. And many of us wrote Fortran computer programs that we felt we could just measure everything in the world, stick it into the computer, and the computer would tell us what's going on. That's not quite how it worked out. It turns out that ecosystems are really complicated things. And the, the, the diagrams we affectionately called spaghetti diagrams, because there were so many components and so many connections that are our framework for thinking about what an ecosystem is looked like a bunch of spaghetti, um, didn't actually fit into the computer. Our computers couldn't handle all the interactions that exist in a complex ecosystem. So while we thought, uh, and, and the International Biological Program spent hundreds of millions of dollars collecting great information, but one of the goals of describing ecosystems um, and be able to predict what was going on at the species level didn't, didn't pan out. So in the, in the current environment, given the idea that we have a sixth extinction, we have 
global poverty, global hunger, inequality that that has has just gotten worse and worse, both within this country and across the world. How do we frame uh, the current situation so that we can incorporate all these different elements? So more to the point of this forum, you know, how does a goal like half Earth fit into the the need to address all these emerging uh, challenges to hum humanity? Um, and to me, that's a conceptual systems level question that is difficult to answer because many of our quantitative models have not been up to the task of being able to allow us to understand how ecosystems work. Pull out one species, so what happens? Pull out another species, so what happens? So I, I don't have an answer. Um, I would like to share with the group uh, of a framework developed by a, an economist uh, whose name is uh, Kate Raworth, who gives us a broad conceptual uh, perspective that allows us to try to connect. And then we can ask more specific scientific questions once we frame it this way. So if you can just pull up the first figure there, that shows the sustainable space for humanity inside there. And you can see there's lots of uh, different issues on the outside from ozone, climate change, including biodiversity. And if we pull up the next one, this is a, so th this framework provides us sort of a, a, a tool to measure ourselves against where we need to be. Uh, and as you can see, biodiversity loss is a huge issue. And so here's a framework that I'm hoping can help us try to connect specific questions about biodiversity, the role of half Earth, um, to the rest of the issues that face humanity at this point in time. So that, for me, that's the ongoing challenge. Dean, thanks very much. I think you've taken us uh, into the realm of ecosystems and larger picture sorts of things. Jesse, your turn. How about the biggest environmental challenge during your career? Thanks, John. It's the industrialization of the oceans. Uh, many of us have contact with, with the oceans, often in the summer. Uh, and we look out and it, they look pristine and innocent very often, but that's really changing. And let me share with you four images which will suggest what's, what's happening. This first image shows underwater noise from uh, emissions from ship. Noise, of course, is how animals communicate in the oceans. It's hard to see in the ocean, but sound is like light in the ocean. And you see the extent of shipping, which now covers most of the oceans. So you really have to go to uh, a few areas of the South Pacific or remote areas between Australia and Madagascar to get quiet oceans these days. So, uh, Shipping is wonderful. It's how we get goods around the world. But uh, every vessel, whether it's a freighter, uh, a tanker, a ferry, Carnival Cruise Lines, also is adding sound to the oceans and changing the, the acoustic environment and in other ways, the, the environment for the animals. Uh, the second slide. I've mentioned communications. Uh, we think when we talk in our cell phones that we're talking through satellites, but we're actually talking along the sea floor. In the last uh, 30 years, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of cables have been laid uh, across the oceans and along the coast, trenching and then burying the cables sometimes, sometimes leaving them exposed. So lots and lots of disturbance of the sea floor and more to come, of course. So this is the world of Google and Amazon. Uh, it's also how we shop. It's uh, what the internet relies on. Now, the, the third slide, fishing. Uh, in green, you see the fished areas of the oceans. It's not just surf casting from uh, the Jersey shore or from uh, near to the, the coast in Florida. Fishing basically goes on everywhere except where it's forbidden. The white areas are areas uh, which are parks in the oceans, marine protected areas, which have limited exploitation of the, the sea life there. And one more slide, aquaculture. Uh, if you eat oysters in Hong Kong, they're coming from a, a farm, a set of farms like this. This is oyster farming uh, in, near Fuzhou, uh, across from Taiwan. And uh, there's more and more aquaculture, whether in Chile or Norway or Maine or uh, British Columbia. And so the coastlines also are becoming, uh, there are lots of pens. And of course, people love seafood or sea life. And in many ways, it's a superior alternative to, to meat from land, but it's also part of this industrialization. 
And of course, we know about offshore oil and gas, and now there are thousands of, uh, uh, of windmills being put offshore. The European community alone plans to add 300 gigawatts of wind, which would require a surface area of 100,000 square kilometers of ocean, about uh, two thirds the surface area of uh, uh, Great Britain and Ireland, uh, just for wind farms for Western Europe. So we're just beginning to grasp the massive industrialization of the oceans now underway uh, on the surface, in the water column, and on the seafloor. And there are just there are all these forms of uh, pollution: the debris, the plastics, oil and chemical spills, runoff of fertilizers, uh, per pesticides, uh, sewage, pharmaceuticals, uh, all, every, all the waste from COVID. Uh, and uh, all the unmetabolized uh, cocaine or fentanyl, it all ends up in the ocean. Construction debris, spoils from dredging. So we have this uh, uh, an abandoned and discarded equipment. So I estimate there are now 50 million large objects in the ocean and there'll be 100 million probably by, by the year 2050. So uh, we need better descriptions of the oceans, what's there. If we want to be able to assess uh, before, during, and after, we have to do the, the before and the during. And most of my career has been about doing thick description of the world as it really is, which isn't easy in the vastness of the ocean, the depths, the darkness, uh, the movement, and so forth. And so uh, it's been fantastic, uh, technologically thrilling, as. Uh, uh, several of the speakers have said, incredible progress of science. At the same time, uh, watching this world around us uh, uh, change. Uh, but we, my, my hope is that we can put in place a system of observation of the oceans, a global ocean observation system, much more like what we have for the atmosphere, where satellites and other devices tell us in real time on the through the weather services and through the weather channel and so forth what's happening, how things are changing. And so that challenge is what I've been working on and hope to continue working on for quite a few more years to come. Now, John, tell us about uh, your own challenges. Wow, we've heard a lot about challenges in the last few minutes, to say the least. I'm going to give a little perspective on what I think one of the biggest challenges has been for my career as a natural history scientist, documenting and understanding biodiversity around the world. In this capacity as a, a natural history scientist, I've spent a lot of time searching for pristine and undisturbed habitats in nature. Uh, these are the places, these pristine habitats, that usually support the highest numbers of species with the largest percentage of previously unknown and undescribed organisms, including the oceans, Jesse. These are the places where the diversity of life and the complexity of nature actually come together. The most significant challenge during these decades of my travel around the world, especially in tropical lands, has been located and working in these undisturbed habitats. When I started as a student at Harvard, these places were plentiful. Uh, hard to believe. I could fly to Panama, I could fly to Colombia, I could fly to the Amazon, then hike or drive to the end of a short road and start collecting plants, many of which would prove to be new to science, and I've named many. Over the years, though, these roads got longer and longer, and the pristine habitats became harder and harder to find. Today, uh, these places, these undisturbed places, are not plentiful by any means. I've watched on almost every continent the transition of the natural world from intact environments to degraded landscapes. And time now grows short for fully documenting biodiversity as the sixth extinction unfolds before our very eyes. For me, the challenge is therefore not only place, but also time. Finding those places where nature still exists, somewhat intact, so we can complete an inventory of life on the planet, but also finding the little time that remains to explore, to understand, and to protect nature while it still thrives. One of the most startling transitions that I have observed also is not just the changes in habitats where biodiversity is found, but also changes in how natural history science is conducted. So this is the process of discovering and describing new species. The professors and grad students and postdocs that I hung around with at Harvard could not wait to get into the field to see nature in situ, to see biodiversity in action, to find plants that were unknown to science 
and to learn more how those plants evolved in their natural habitats. One of the most engaging aspects of these travels, uh, again, pr primarily in the tropics, was learning how local people also interacted with diverse, biodiversity, how they found the plants, how they used the plants, how they named the plants, and how they respected the plants. All of this field work required a lot of planning and a lot of time away. Uh, we would bring back our specimens to the museum, sometimes grow them in the greenhouses, process them, and at the same time share what we were finding with our colleagues in the countries where we had traveled. Being in the field was paramount. Not so today. Today, graduate students and professors and even museum curators like myself devote the vast majority of our time in the lab, not in the field. Several decades ago, we entered the era of exploring biodiversity, not by observations in the field, but by sequencing DNA in the lab. As Ed Wilson once told me, we have become, quote, infatuated with the macromolecule, unquote. We now spend our time grinding up tissue and sequencing DNA for lengthy comparative analysis that we run on supercomputers. I admit that I have been smitten by this infatuation with DNA as well. I spent a good chunk of my time and career developing a tool called DNA barcoding to identify species by their DNA sequences rather than by their morphological characteristics. And now we are generating entire genomes of species as part of the Earth Biogenome Project so that we'll have a complete DNA blueprint of all species on the planet. Genomic information certainly does help us to understand species and how nature works. There's no question in my mind about that. But spending so much time in the lab separates us as scientists and as citizens from experiencing nature directly where it lives. It is very possible that we will not have the time nor be able to get to the places to find out more about biodiversity before much of it is gone. Two biggest challenges for me have been time and place. I'm not sure if it's gonna change in the near future. So I'll end there and Jesse, we can turn it over and move to the next set of questions, I think. Yes, now we, we wanna specifically ask uh, each of the panelists, okay, how can the half earth concept help? How can it help in the ecosystems that Dean has spoken about in the Himalayas, in Maine, in the Amazon, in the oceans? Uh, uh, we hope we'll have another forum, perhaps in the winter, uh, in which we'll get more help from lawyers and economists and others really digging into some of the, the, uh, the real obstacles. But we'd like to begin that process now and uh, explore how, Dean, can, what, what can we do? What are the, the uh, uh, how would Half Earth change the course of uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the slices in the pie you showed us? So I think we need to keep doing what we're doing. Um, national park designation, reserve designation, private land conservation. And we need to continue that with more public and private investment. We need to continue to invent new tools. Uh, the whole carbon issue has created many, many new opportunities for protecting land through carbon markets. We need legislation like the Tropical Forest and Coral Reef Conservation Reauthorization Act that needs more public support, that, that uh, allows debt for nature kinds of swaps, the kinds of tools we need to use to try to reach a half earth kind of goal um, are going to require major shifts in uh, public policy and public and private investment. So the, the question is, what's holding us back in doing that? And, and I would argue that a piece of that is how we frame the question. Um, while most of us, uh, biologists and scientists, take the connection between biodiversity and the welfare of humanity as a, as a direct linkage, I don't think most uh, of humanity actually understands that. And so I think we need to be more persuasive, tell better stories about how biodiversity actually benefits the human condition. And I think um, that we can direct our science to, you know, collect information that documents these kinds of stories. And then we need to be really adept 
at getting those stories out so we get more public and private investment. Thank you, Dean. Let's uh, go back to New England and go to Sharon. And do you have any lessons learned about land preservation on a local level from your beautiful state of Maine that can be applied globally to a half earth concept? Yes, I do. Um, I'd like to suggest that uh, that working for land preservation on a local and state level can be fertile ground for finding common ground across this partisan divide that is paralyzing us on policy, both on climate and maybe on biodiversity. And I and I also think in in the in the bigger national arena that I, I'm somewhat more optimistic about. Um, uh, about movement across the divide on conservation issues than I am on, on issues about controlling fossil fuel emissions. And that's maybe for, for obvious reasons um, uh, that the armies are, are different in, in each case. But I wanna tell you a little bit about the Orono Land Trust in my hometown in Maine. Um, it was founded in 1986 to buy a 44-acre plot of forest pretty much in town that was slated for development. I joined the board when I moved to Orono in 94, and it still owned that only that 44-acre tract. Um, we initiated a larger effort to acquire land and easements. And since then, largely to the, due to the efforts of others since I moved on to other boards, the land trust has exploded in a good way. It now is involved in the protection of 5,689 acres with 25 miles of recreational trails. Um, it, its crown jewel is a 5,000 acre tract of forest and wetland with five active um, heron nests among many other species. And it includes three miles of undeveloped shorefront on the largest lake within 30 miles of the city of Bangor. Quite an accomplishment for an all volunteer organization to date. Now I wanna tell you a story about the Land for Maine's Future Program, which is kind of a state funded land trust that's been in existence since 1987. Um, since it was founded, it's funded $132 million to conserve 600,000 acres of land and another 40,000 was appropriated this last legislative session. The, the really interesting uh, story I have for you is that the Sportsmen's Alliance of Maine, which represents 300,000 sportsmen and women throughout Maine, uh, hunters, fishers primarily, has been a major participant in framing the goals and purchases of LMF, along with numerous land trusts and environmental organizations. As you may have heard, we're facing a close governor's race with former governor Paul LePage, who prided himself as being the nation's Trumpiest governor, is seeking to unseat his successor, Janet Mills. During his eight years in office, LePage obstructed any appropriations to land for Maine's future. When he first ran, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine gave him an A rating. This time around, Janet Mills won an A rating from Sam and LePage an incomplete, precisely because he failed to support the conservation activities of Land for Maine's future. And you probably also know that the National Wildlife Federation, which, which is a national affiliate of our Natural Resources Council of Maine, has followed the model since 1936 of bringing hunters and anglers and farmers together with environmentalists and outdoor enthusiasts. On the theme of making common cause with hunters, I wanna make the point that in Maine, now more than ever, hunting is largely for subsistence. For my friends and neighbors, it's all about the meat in the freezer. Applying the Maine experience to the global context, I don't support funding conservations through commercializing big game hunting. Slide, please. This is from the real estate section of the Wall Street Journal, and it shows a Texas family's $600,000 2,500 square foot addition to their mansion to spay the farming, the family's hunting trophies. There has to be a better way to harness private equity so to support conservation than at the price of the lives of rare and threatened species. 
perhaps we can explore some of those alternative ways as this initiative unfolds. I appreciate your perspective, Sharon, very much. Thank you for those ex examples, particularly from your home state of Maine. Uh, Jesse. Uh, first, let me say I love land trusts and sea trusts, and maybe our class should invest in them. Maybe we should, uh, whether it's in Maine or in the oceans, maybe we need a class island somewhere uh, and some protected water or a class mountain in the Himalayas. Uh, I think there, there are enormous opportunities in, in this direction. And there are great groups to partner with like Conservation International, the Nature Conservancy in the state of Massachusetts, the trustees of reservations, uh, the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Federation, NIFWIF, there are a lot of good groups that are trying to do this. Uh, but let me say also a little bit about the difficulties in the oceans. Uh, the, the next slide, please. Uh, the oceans are vast. Uh, John did mention that there is uh, there are some marine protected areas in the oceans, and you see some of them here uh, in purple, those that are pretty well implemented, uh, highly fully protected. In uh, blue, those are less so. But of course, uh, you have to keep in mind that you need a good Navy or a good Coast Guard if you want to enforce behavior and compliance. And in many parts of the world where people would like to have uh, better marine protection, it's simply not possible because of poor governance. There's also the problem, the next slide, that of course in the oceans, the, the animals move. Of course, animals on land may move as well. But especially in the oceans, there are lots of migratory species. Uh, here you see uh, tracks of a range of species from humpback whales to sea lions to uh, tuna and sharks uh, and even a few seabirds. So you know, a turtle may swim from, from Mexico to the Philippines. And so it, simply protecting fixed areas is not enough. And the water itself moves, of course, as well. So in the oceans, we need both a big expansion of this concept of uh, protected areas, the 30 by 30 or a 50% a half earth, but we also need to think of big, uh, bold, creative ways to deal with migratory species uh, as well. So uh, and that begins to be possible as we learn more and more about the behavior. If you give animals cell phones, you can know where they are, and it can. it's now increasingly possible to uh, define zones where protection should be uh, occur in a particular time because a spawning is occurring uh, or some other uh, biologically important important process. But the bottom line is in the oceans we need to the oceans are really big and we we need to think really big if we want to continue to have diverse and abundant sea life. Uh, and we need much more effective collective efforts also to reduce pollution at its sources. Thanks. Okay, and now, uh, Brat. I may be at some risk of being called out here, and, and this could be pr provocative, but uh, one uh, challenge uh, that I've encountered that I didn't really expect in my um, conservation career uh, was to find that, uh, prim in some cases, primarily Western academics and journalists are, have tried to uh, redefine parks and protected areas um, as uh, a privileged, uh, colonial, imperialistic, archaic ideologies of so-called uh, fortress conservation. And some have ad advocated returning ownership of Chitwan National Park, for instance, and other protected areas uh, to the local people. Now this ties into the land back movement in the US, which would uh, propose at its extreme that our national parks be returned to Native American tribes and it was a subject of a cover story of the Atlantic last year, you might be aware of. There's no question that all these indigenous people uh, need attention, dignity, and support, and then they should be drawn into the management of protected areas and that their indigenous knowledge has been overlooked. Um, I took two uh, bio courses with uh, Schultes and was way into ethnobotany myself. But why is it? I might ask that academics uh, presume, or at least in some cases, that relatively pristine, uh, biodiverse, um, high value protected areas should carry the burden of solving social issues. In the case of uh, Chitwan Park, this narrative tends to conflate 
poor squatters from outside the area with indigenous people. But most local residents and Nepalese realize that if hypothetically the park could be turned over to them, the first thing they would do would be to sell it. And there are many buyers who are waiting. One of the founders of Nepal's protected area system told me that Western academics and journalists claiming to speak on behalf of uh, indigenous rights are uh, falling uh, right into the hands of corporate interests that would love to develop and commercialize uh, Chitwan. And uh, I didn't see, the, I, I didn't really foresee the extent to which international agencies are trying to shoehorn the absolute minimum of conservation objectives into far bigger agendas of income generation, uh, poverty alleviation, infrastructure development, uh, geohazard mitigation, social justice, and climate change adaptation. Uh, I might suggest that the activism that is centered on environmental justice has become co-opted by what is really social justice. I mention this because if we are to attempt to achieve half earth conservation objectives within our grandchildren's lifetimes, we will have to collectively re-envision and redefine who we are relative to nature. We'll have to draw clear boundaries and establish clear goals that recharacterize the wild parts of our planet as having value for all of us moving forward, rather than simply reacting to historical and special interest grievances and to corporate interests as well. It increasingly appears to me at least that all of us on lifeboat Earth are paddling furiously in different directions. Now, I'm not anti-human, but uh, considering the overwhelming success of our species with now 8 billion of us, is it too much to ask that we protect at least half of the wildly biodiverse but threatened planet we live on? We recently lost uh, Dave Foreman of Earth First. Uh, maybe it's time we reconvened with a new mission called Half Earth First. Right. That's an eloquent statement. And the half earth, of course, could include parts that we have polluted and damaged and could be restored. So it's not only a matter of conservation for the relatively pristine areas, but uh, uh, the areas that could be part of the half earth that uh, Wilson talks about could be, could be areas that uh, have not been treated so well. And this is a beautiful transition to our final question to John. Uh, are species, in fact, what we are really trying to protect by, by half Earth? Thank you, Jesse. I think as a, as a biodiversity scientist, that's always been on my mind. What are we trying to protect? And we often talk about the diversity of life in terms of number of species. And so I'd like to start by addressing how many species are there? And unfortunately, this is a question that has hounded biodiversity scientists for centuries, even though we've been naming species of plants, animals, and fungi for over three centuries, we still do not have an answer to that question. How many species are there? Uh, interesting, in 1994, Sir Robert May, a theoretical biologist, wrote a paper in which he calculated that, well, don't worry about how many species, we will know in the year 2044. That was the conclusion of his paper. Not, not how many species we have, but we will find out, don't worry. Well, we're not there yet, but we, we have some idea and I'd like to review those quickly in, in terms of numbers of species. So let's start with plants. I'm a botanist. I know most about plants. Uh, in 19, excuse me, in 2016, a group of botanists at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, they added up all the species that they had ever recorded and came up with a figure. And this is perfect Q in terms of preciseness, that there were 383,671 species of plants. Now, if that's not exact, I don't know what is. I did some of my own calculations based upon their numbers and uh, determined that we probably have about 35,000 species of plants still left to discover and name and know something about. That's about 10% of what we know of plants right now, that still is more. 
So we're almost there. I also calculated when we might find these last 35,000 species. And my figure came out to the year 2032, the botanist, a botanist will describe and discover the, the last species of plant on the planet, if he acts quick. Uh, but if we actually look at all of life on the planet, our estimates are still wildly, wildly speculative. And our estimates of all species range from maybe 1 million species on the planet up to 100 million species. Now, if that is imprecise or that I don't know what is precise, it's just quite amazing. That's a pretty big spread. However, I think most biologists between that one to 100 million species would suggest that maybe there are 10 million species of plants, it's not of plants, excuse me, of all life on the planet right now. And that's, I think, a reasonable number that most people are accepting. But here's the kicker about that 10 million species. We've only identified and named 1.8 million of those 10 millions. Less than 20% of the species on the planet do we even know exist? So if we're going to protect it, we really need to speed up our process of knowing what we're protecting, and that gets to be uh, a pretty big challenge. But if we, even if we don't even know how many species there are on the planet, the question becomes, is it really the number of species and the breadth of species that we are really trying to protect with a half-Earth effort? And I would like to say that the answer is no. It's not numbers of species at all. That's the beginning of understanding what nature is about, but that's not the end of what we're going to try to protect. We should really define the diversity of life to what I would call the complexity of nature. And that encounters or entails some of the stuff that Brat was just talking about and Jesse. That entails the interactions between species, not just the numbers and in individual species. And so I'd like to give you an example of those interactions from some of my own research. So if we could bring up that first slide. Well, here we go. We, we started it. Heliconias and the hummingbirds that visit them. It's a very complex system, but couldn't be more fascinating. Okay, let's start that video now. What you're looking at here is a bronzy hermit hummingbird with a long curved bill. It's sitting on a heliconia, and you're going to see it visit a flower of heliconia. Now, not unexpectedly, that flower of heliconia has the same length and same curvature as that hummingbird's bill. They've evolved together. What's also interesting is you look at the close match between the hovering behavior of the bird, notice it's hovering, and how the flower is presented by the plant so the bird can get to it. There's also an exact, look, you can see the pollen being placed on the head of that hummingbird. There's an exact placement of the pollen to make sure that that flower is fertilized so the plant can reproduce. And the last thing, which you really can't see from this, this uh, video, is that the flower produces the exact amount of nectar in both concentration and amount that the hummingbird needs for its own energy needs. So this is a system of interactions between a bird and a plant that have evolved probably over five million years that is, that is really the complexity of nature that we're talking about. Uh, I think we have time for just one more. If you could bring up that next one, and this is just going to take a few seconds because I want you to see one of the most interesting behaviors of a hummingbird I've seen. This hummingbird, this is called a green hermit hummingbird, has evolved the ability to fly upside down in order to correctly visit this flower of heliconia. Uh, this goes on for hours, but he can get his bill in there with the same curvature, the same length into this flower by flying upside down and he's, he or she has learned to do it. Okay, we can, we can stop there. Uh, so this is just one interaction between this, this system of birds and the plants that they pollinate. But if you look closely at that bird and that tree or that plant, there's all these other interactions going on. If, if you really knew what you were looking for, you could have seen a mite run out of the nostril of the hummingbird into the flower to suck up nectar while the hummingbird is, is uh, pollinating there. It would run back in and then it goes to the next flower. There's also beetles that live on the plants that only feed on these plants. And they have specialized microbiomes in their guts that allow them to process the biochemicals in the plant. Uh, it just goes on. And there's mites that live on the beetles that are feeding on the, this. This sort of interaction is just fantastic. And that's really the complexity of life that I think we have to be thinking about and what we want to protect when we want to protect 50% uh, of the planet. 
this complexity of life is, is really what we're losing when intact environments become degraded landscapes. Of course, we are losing species, but we're also losing all these multitude of interactions as one species goes extinct. So ha half Earth, in my mind, is about conserving this complexity of nature, as well as conserving all the species that are involved in these interactions. So I'll, I'll stop there, and then maybe we can go on and have a little discussion among ourselves. John, that was uh, elegant. And uh, of course, uh, beauty is so much a part of uh, the story, uh, which we all, mu all must always uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we've heard a, a wide range of, uh, first, we've heard about a wide range of environmental careers, which was really part of this evening's uh, point that what the environmental work can be field work and it can be lab work and it can it can be modeling work it can be uh, teaching it can be advocacy it can be lawsuits uh, uh, it can be uh, worrying primarily about people's roles and keeping vibrant communities uh, it can be about uh, hummingbirds and heliconia so uh, the uh, and there are, uh, I think, several dozen other members of 73 who ended up uh, with these environmental journeys. And uh, we hope we'll hear from more of you and uh, perhaps uh, have a bit of a, uh, a green rendezvous uh, uh, at the 50th uh, among people who've done this and others who would just enjoy talking about it and, and learning about it. And we've heard about a bunch of ideas uh, about land trusts, uh, about carbon orchards from 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 Dean, about uh, uh, discovery and documentation from from John, uh, from brought about uh, uh, how to conceptualize the problems and f finding cultural ways that uh, that uh, uh, people will accept so that we can make progress both on the human side and and for the hummingbirds, so to say. Okay. Uh, Team, group, jump in. Any comments uh, you'd like to offer as a result of the discussion so far? And then we'll also take a few uh, questions that have come in from uh, uh, the participants. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll ask Brad a question. When he sees me showing hummingbirds and heliconias in the lowland forests of the Amazon and Central America, what does that make you think about the high Himalayas where you've spent uh, your time? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, John. Great question. First off, Heliconia, uh, <laughs> right on. It's such a, a beautiful um, uh, <laughs> uh, metaphor for uh, so many dynamics that are perhaps uh, active on a larger scale in the Himalayas. And one of those uh, dynamics, uh, interestingly, is actually between uh, people and livestock and um, a tree uh, cover. Uh, one thing in the Mount Everest area, uh, inter uh, kind of interesting anecdote is that with uh, the income from mountaineering and tourism, many of the uh, indigenous Sherpa people there have outmigrated. There's been uh, quite a uh, massive outmigration, and they have given up herding, uh, herding of yaks. And what's happened is the um, the tree line has actually uh, moved down as a result, and. Uh, rhododendron and uh, alpine firs are recolonizing some of the high pastures. And some biologists have found that, uh, although that's a, a good uh, trend, at least they're not cutting down uh, the trees, that some of the most biodiverse uh, landscapes in the high Himalayas are those that have co-evolved with yaks, uh, in particular domestic yaks, over the past 500 years. Uh, so um, there are lots of biodiversity uh, feedback loops that are happening uh, right there at Treeline. Very interesting. Any other? Sharon, I'd like to ask you, actually, based upon your uh, experience there in, in Maine, you, you started getting into to politics a little bit. And I'm wondering, not a little bit, I guess more than a little bit, uh, but do you think biodiversity and natural environments can actually rise above politics in, in some way? And you're sure. talking about the hunters and the people yeah. that are actually partnering with unlikely partners uh, as these issues come up. Exactly. I mean, that that was really my point, that I think there's more, more for example, I think there's more hope for moving ahead, um, maybe in the near future, 
to um, to get the U.S. to sign on to the Convention on Biodiversity. Mm -hmm. More hopeful of that than for regulating fossil fuel emissions. Um, I, it's my understanding that the major and and some of you may have been much more closely involved in this whole controversy about the Convention on Biodiversity. But it's my understanding that the major uh, industry uh, opponents were um, were biotech, who felt that their patents were going to be threatened by the convention, and pharmaceuticals who wanted free reign to go into the jungle and find various cures for cancer or whatever. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of argument that, that the convention wouldn't have done any of that. Um, but I understand biotech has, has um, pulled back and is supportive of it. And I think uh, pharmaceuticals, um, um, it would be interesting to know whether, um, whether they're uh, open to, to changing their perspective on that. Um, and I'd really be interested in, in knowing whether any of us or anyone in the audience has plans to attend the, the uh, conference in, in uh, Montreal in December, um, because it, I think it would be fertile ground for um, learning about what opportunities we might um, get engaged with. Let me respond to that quickly, and then we'll, we'll get to some of the questions from the audience. But yes, I will be going to Montreal. Okay. I, I've been involved in, and particularly as an issue coming up at this convention of the parties on just what I said, kind of the infatuation with the macromolecule. This is the first time that digital sequence information is going to be on the docket in terms of whether it is shared in an open access way or whether it's continued to be protected locally uh, so profits can rightly go back to the country where biodiversity comes from. So it's, a, it's gonna be a big issue. I'm interested to see what's happening, but that infatuation with DNA is now going right into the heart of the Convention on Biological Diversity. <laughs> yeah. Jesse, so we, should we go to questions from yeah. uh, uh, Dean, yes. maybe? Let Dean make yeah. a statement. Yeah, Dean, Dean first. And then... Yeah, so some of the uh, questions in, in the Q&A section are, are sort of related to the um, the, the trade-offs that, that we're faced with. And I, I guess one way of characterizing that would be, you know, how do we... Do, do we think about it as a competition between human climate refugees and plant and animal climate refugees um, that are um, both from climate change as they have to migrate and from uh, habitat loss? And I think that's that, that's that, that's not a way. If we frame it that way, that's not a way we're going to um, ever get to something like half Earth, because I think um, the the increasing challenge of, of human populations and especially uh, com complicated by um, climate change refugees, um, it, it's just going to be most of the world is going to say we need the land for people. Um, I, I think more than the line of maybe what uh, Jesse was suggesting is that we need to be more creative and think about how we can trade off land that can benefit both uh, plants and animals and people um, using just a, an enormous um, uh, creativity in regeneration. I, you know, I think about a, a lot about all the work that has been done in thinking about um, uh, mimicking earth, uh, earth processes, uh, biomimicry, and things like that, that um, have really changed how we think things can change in terms of habitat and productivity on a much faster time scale than we normally would think about. Dean, I love your image of the, or your idea about the, the mobile and the not, because in the oceans, it's the same story. You basically have three kinds of animals in the ocean. You have the sessile animals like barnacles that stay in one place. Then you have animals like uh, lobsters, uh, some other animals that move around a bit or drift a bit, and then you have the tuna, and you know th that go these long distances. The tuna, you could say, they're sort of like high tech workers. You know, they can move wherever the jobs are, uh, but the barnacles are stuck. So uh, I, I think the idea of uh, thinking this through a little bit uh, is uh, there. There may be some interesting possibilities there, but I'd like to go to Sharon's comment about biodiversity. And part of the reason I'm very enthusiastic about our subject for this evening 
I think you're right that I think in America, at least, the chance of, of a large fraction of the population supporting something is much better on biodiversity. I would say for my own career, I know everybody wants clean beaches. There, there are things where you can really get a big, big fraction of the population to agree. And I, let's, let's work on those things. I'm not saying we shouldn't also work on the very divisive ones, but let's not, let's not neglect the opportunities that, that exist and Brad, I think mountains are really like that too. I think people love mountains. They, people want mountains, lots of people want mountains to be well cared for. So, you know, we should, we should seize the opportunities that half earth opens our mind to. Yeah, I, I could chime in and say that um, by default, uh, mountains uh, to some degree, because, by virtue of their isolation, uh, are not as accessible as, say, wetlands, which are so readily filled in for uh, industrialization uh, purposes. And there's one, um, well, uh, certainly you may be aware of the Y to Y or Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. Um, and speaking to Dean's uh, point is, um, uh, how can we make half Earth work? Well, um, Y to Y, at least, is really dedicated and they are achieving quite uh, some success by creating corridors uh, from uh, the uh, Northern uh, Yukon all the way down through uh, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, wildlife overpasses, underpasses, uh, they're buying up land uh, from ranchers to create corridors so that uh, genetic uh, material, uh, wildlife um, can flow. And so this may be the direction that we're headed in, at least in the mountains. We've talked about mountains and oceans. We have a great question from Jana Smith. Can suburban backyards contribute to half earth? Dean, maybe that's one for you. I think we have to be creative. I think we have to take everything. I mean, I, I really resonate with your point about, you know, the restoration of other places. We just can't assume because once we've destroyed something that it's gone and um, re restoration can include that. And then if we start thinking about, uh, you know, backyard habitats and things like that, I think that they clearly uh, uh, speak to biodiversity and um, maybe even more so, um, it, it speaks to, to the issue that I have of trying to get more of humanity to, to think about the linkage, you know, people who have backyard habitats and and in the suburbs and enjoying the biodiversity in their own little backyard, have a different attitude towards thinking about um, both legal protections and public and private investment. Um, so, so you know, that's that's a way of getting there. If just more people sign on. And you know, if you're interested in insects and birds, of course, yeah. backyards can. There's a lot of leverage out there. Yeah. So now I know we're at 8:22. So John, maybe I'll turn it back to you and Marion for uh, the sort of uh, wrap up of the, the evening. Yeah, one of the things we like to do at the end of these uh, fora is to have what we call call to action. And so I, our three panelists, uh, Sharon, Brat, and Dean, each would like to make a short statement about what they think would be an appropriate call for action with regards to half earth. So let's see, why don't we start with Brat, do you wanna begin this? Uh, uh, well, sure. Uh, briefly, um, in my neighborhood in Jackson Hole, uh, we have two billionaires uh, who have dedicated a majority of their wealth to conservation. I, I find it very inspiring. Avon Chouinard, uh, who is now of the Hold Fast Collective, that's where he donated his uh, fortune, and Hans-Jörg Wies uh, of the Wies Fund for Nature, um, have also uh, dedicated themselves to uh, biodiversity. So hopefully their examples will attract others into taking action. Um, the, I, there may be a slide there um, in the um, Himalayas, uh, the Snow Leopard uh, Conservancy, which I've worked with, uh, continues to work toward uh, reducing human wildlife uh, conflict. We're looking at uh, solar powered electric fences right now. And uh, the last slide uh, that I have, um, and uh, again, connecting landscapes and wildlife movement corridors is one of the most important efforts, uh, I feel, 
uh, through the Y to Y. <laughs> they all seem to like the bear uh, logo there. Uh, the Y to Y, the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, initiative. Also uh, Vital Ground uh, based in Montana, which works with Y to Y. Um, and uh, the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative, which is a consortium of uh, wildlife scholars. I'm uh, also inspired by, uh, uh, especially by National Geographic writer, Doug uh, Chadwick, um, whose recent book, uh, Four Fifths a Grizzly, I feel really compellingly uh, captures in uh, E.O. Wilson spirit, uh, our genetic human connection to wildlife and nature. Terrific, thank you. Sharon, how about you? Yeah, Speaking well, I'm from... really excited about going forward with us and everyone who will join us to look at approaches to national and global issues, but on the theme of acting locally, I just want to recommend that everyone uh, either found or join a land trust. And uh, it's obvious that um, unlike controlling greenhouse gases, there are direct immediate benefits in terms of lifestyle and health and community to work together to uh, preserve and maintain wild places in our backyards. Um, and uh, so I, that's my, my pitch for right now, but let's move on to national and global thinking too. Great. Sharon, just a question. Is there any clearinghouse for trusts, local trusts or state trusts or national oh, yes. trusts? There, there, there's a land trust alliance, which is, um, and actually they have affiliates. So we had an affiliate of the land trust alliance that helped steward us on various issues, but there's a national land trust alliance, which will tell you exactly how much land is being preserved in land trust. Uh, nationwide, it's it's, right. it's a rather it's a rather very small fraction of the total land in the United States, but mm -hmm. to a lot of people it means a lot, um, and uh, and they have all kinds of resources for setting one up and um, and monitoring it and doing Great. purchases and easements. Just what we wanted to know. Thanks very much, Dean. Your final thoughts here. Yeah, I, I'm just hoping that out there in our class or any other class that's listening to us, that there are storytellers, media storytellers that could work with us to really help us uh, make those connections. Um, and there, there certainly are lots of good research that shows the connection between biodiversity and human health and welfare, both in terms of food uh, and in terms of health, human health. Um, those, those stories... Uh, as a scientist, I can't tell those stories. I don't, I don't even know how to use social media. So uh, <laughs> the, the, there, are, there are definitely folks out there who have that. And if they're sympathetic with the idea of, of biodiversity as a component of saving our planet, um, let's act together. That's great, definitely. Uh, I should say on behalf of the whole panel and Class Act itself, we don't know what to do next. We thought we'd get together and there's a... Uh, environment and climate change working group in class act 73 they came up to suggest do we have this uh, panel to start with but we are looking to all of you that are listening here tonight to come up with some ideas volunteer your help volunteer your ideas come and join us you don't have to be an expert on climate change you don't have to be an expert on heliconia i'll take care of heliconia for you uh, but you do have to come with some ideas and some enthusiasm and i think together uh we're not going to solve this problem class act, but we are going to begin to try to find solutions that could help us move this whole uh, idea forward of half earth. I want to remind everyone that we are gonna follow up this forum with another forum in several months that will continue to address half earth, but more from the feasibility of half, half earth. I know a lot of you have questions is how is this going to be done? That was not necessarily our mission tonight. Our mission was to talk about biodiversity. But in the next forum, we will uh, bring different experts from class of 73 together to talk about the politics, the economics, the social implications of half earth and how we might move forward on that. So, so stay tuned where we're going for that. Uh, before I turn this back to Marion, I just would like to thank her for helping us do all this and her production team without their expertise in getting slides going and keeping us all on track and everything, we would not have uh, been able to complete this within one minute of our time. 
So thanks very much to all of you for helping on that. Um, so Marion, I'll turn, turn it back to you now. Thank you all for this in really inspiring discussion on biodiversity and the environment and half earth conservation. I am sure that Professor Wilson is smiling down on us all. Uh, this forum, as John said, I'm going to reiterate is the first action of Class Act HR 73 Environment and Climate Change Working Group as we seek to discover and design initial projects that will advance the health of our planet, including human societies today and tomorrow. Our working group is exploring additional actions that we can take collectively to address these issues in a broad way across the Harvard community and outside. We are seeking people like you who are listening tonight to help us succeed. We don't know yet what these actions are going to be, but judging from tonight's forum, we believe that there are activists among you ready to participate with us. You do not have to be an environment or climate uh, expert, scientist, educator, or policymaker to participate. You only have to be interested in getting something constructive done. If you're interested and supportive, send us an email to classact at classacthr73 at gmail.com and we'll get right back to you. And again, thank you, John, Jesse, Brat, Dean, and Sharon for educating us and for inspiring us. My thanks also go, as John said, to the members of our program and production teams. Uh, the program group includes all the members of the Class Act Environment and Climate Change Work Group, whom, whom you can join if you would like to, uh, who, and they are too numerous to list here, but our fantastic forum production team, which works tirelessly on all of our forums, uh, includes Sarah Greenberg, who is our producer, Jackie Swearingen, Sarah Ulrich, Andrea Kirsch, uh, Katie Marinello, Kate Freed, Diana Labanchu, and our videographer, Rick Brotman. And finally, to all of you who came and, and joined us tonight, thank you for being with us.